Thank you. It's in the stew. I do actually. Yeah. So if I can, Miss Wilmer, Winmar, sorry. Um, You'd be aware that the Senate has, uh, is conducting an inquiry into flags of convenience vessels, and I won't go too much into it, but we did uh, put out a uh, report, an interim report, and the government responded to that two weeks ago. So I just want to ask you a couple of questions around the government's response to our, to our report. And I want to take you to recommendation 2, 4.12, where the committee recommends that this review included a comprehensive whole of government assessment of the potential security risk posed by flag of convenience vessels and foreign crews. So has the OTS read these recommendations? Yes, we have, Senator. Okay, thank you, Ms Wimmer. Uh, so you'd be well aware of the uh, statements by Australian Border Force in their submission to the inquiry warning of the national security vulnerabilities created in the FOC, state, uh, FOC system. Yes, Senator. Yep, thank you. So has the OTS made any attempt to better understand the FOC system of ship deregulation and have you done anything to counter Australian Border Force's deep concerns about the attractiveness of FOCs to terrorists and crime organisations in our domestic trade? Senator, um, <coughs> we, uh, we are confident with, uh, in Australia's current approach to maritime security. It is comprehensive and it involves a number of agencies and measures. Um, and it's designed to apply to all vessels, irrespective of flag state, uh, which enter Australian ports. So the other thing that I uh, also note is that there is no information from the intelligence community at the moment to indicate any kind of specific threat of unlawful interference to Australia's maritime transport sector. And as I said before, we monitor that very closely. I understand that, but it was only a few months ago when Captain Salas was sailing in and out of the Australian ports and no one even knew. So that's why I'm raising these issues. And you know very well my feelings here in this area. So as much as I would love, and it's 9.30 at night, so we've missed play school and all the other stuff that reports on what goes on here, without scaring the horses, we haven't got it completely right yet. Although our people in border forces are doing their darndest. We're not going to fool ourselves to think that we're on top of everything. So, has there been an assessment of the potential security risks posed by FOCs in the Australian coastal trade? Not specifically flags of convenience, but we are, as I say, um, looking at the threat environment all the time and adjusting our regulatory regime. Okay. Does the OTS receive information about ships which have been involved in criminal activities in our ports? Uh, no, we don't. Under our legislation, uh, we specifically have a purpose that looks at unlawful interference with maritime transport, um, and that in the in the explanatory explanatory memorandum is around security. Can I just ask, mm, what okay. does adjusting your regulatory regime mean? Do you actually wait for a tip off and then do inspections, and in the absence of a tip off, you don't do any inspections? Is that no, how it works? no. So we work closely with the mm. intelligence community. <clears throat> And, uh, I if understand they, you've said that repeatedly, but I don't really know what that means. That's right. And so if they tell us that something has Who's changed... they? The intelligence community, intelligence Who's agencies. So ASIO, for instance, is a close yes, partner of ours. ASIO. That's right. Um, AFP. Uh, AFP, that's right. Water Force. We talk with DIBP. And, yes, that's right. And aren't right. they saying that they're concerned? Uh, yeah. They, they yeah. did about flags of convenience, but I'm talking specifically about the threat environment. And uh, ASIO is actually the preeminent um, Australian agency that looks at threat. And we. Uh, so, border, <laughs> and let me get this right. So, Border Force have indicated flags of convenience are an issue, but they're not the preeminent um, source of information. ASIO is. Is uh, that what you're telling us? I, I'm saying that ASIO is uh, concerned with the security threat environment. And that is what we are concerned with under our legislation. And, and what is Border Force concerned about then, not security? Uh, what are they, they concerned were, about people I, smuggling? I can't or? quite remember what their, um, their submission... Well, you're uh, speaking with great made. authority and now you can't remember what Border Force's concerns are. Not specifically, Senator. Well, perhaps you can take on notice what Border Force's concerns were because you've uh, you know, attempted to put a position where uh, there is no threat. We know that ASIO, AFP, <coughs> Border Force, who else? Uh, they're the primary agencies that so we, we speak about. So we don't listen threat. to the international, you know, Interpol or anybody else that's... 
No, because the agencies that we deal with are looking okay. at so our So we know one out of the three has indicated concerns, but they're not the preeminent one. Uh, and I'd have to go back and actually look at what their concerns were, Senator. Well, okay. I just well, well, I can help you. You know, it, it is, it, they made it very, very clear that they had uh, uh, serious concerns about the vulnerabilities created by the FOC system. It's pretty simple. They didn't go into any detail, but that's what they said. Because the whole recommendation to 4.12 says that we should have, and, and this is supported by all senators, not just the opposition senators, a comprehensive whole of government assessment of the potential security risk. So we've only got one part, and it just appears by the government's response that Mickey Mouse doesn't see the move along, even though border protection, immigration and border protection are concerned, it appears OTS, AFP, ASIO have no concerns. That's how it appears. It was the government's response. So you, you've... You so I'm just not quite sure what the question was. Well, the question was very simple. Do you have concerns because Border Protection has uh, identified that there are some serious security risks with FOCs? Senator, the way, the way I interpret what uh, Border um, DIBP has talked about in terms of flags of convenience, I'm not quite sure what um, concerns they are referring to as they're talking about with the flags of convenience regime generally, and whether it's an immigration concern or a concern around criminality. They have a much broader mandate, obviously, than we do. And we just look at security. We take our sure. lead from ASIO, which provides sure. us with that guidance and, on the and threat Ms. environment. We don't expect Border Force to come out and say, here's what they can do if they want to smuggle guns or drugs or throw people overboard. We don't understand that. But we would. That's why we call for a recommendation for a whole of government review. So you're all part of the same and team. I think right. some of the issues for Border Force may well be around the operation of the maritime crew visa, for instance, yeah, sure. matters on which Absolutely. we, we yeah. don't get involved. No, no. Uh, so they may be those types of issues which they're flagging with the committee. No, no, I understand, but what so I'm just the asking why is the whole of government is not support the whole of government review. So what, what would characterise a threat from Asia? <clears throat> Someone <clears throat> sailing into Sydney Harbour and blowing it up under the Harbour Bridge or something? What, what, are you, what is Asia going to tell you? I wouldn't like to uh, speculate what ASIO might do. That's obviously something for them. But the key things that they advise us on are the intent and capability of people that might have intent to do something around um, a, a terrorist threat. Well, the most obvious intent and capability was to sail past Australia and meet up with a, a reasonable sized yacht out of uh, Sydney Harbour and bring in about 50 kilos of cocaine. Do they advise you of that sort of strategy? So, Senator, um, we're concerned about terrorist uh, attacks. Yeah, that's that's what I'm trying to define. So you're, you're working out whether flags of convenience are a terrorist threat to Australia and you avoid any information about smuggling or so, damage Senator, to the environment. That, that information wouldn't be provided to us, Senator. Any information which intelligence agencies are collecting <clears> in relation <throat> to... Uh, other illegal activities uh, would go to those relevant agencies. Okay. We only receive threat assessments as they relate to threats to the transport sector. So uh, as I hear your evidence, you're refining your role to a very thin sliver of terrorist. That, that's what our legislation uh, is based on. And I, I might also mention that um, we receive that threat environment reporting, but our regime applies equally to anyone who wants to access a secure area um, at a seaport. So it's irrelevant <coughs> of um, what vessel they come on and whether it has a what flag state it has. Okay. So I'm just trying to reconcile the fact that you're concerned about a cocaine smuggler being employed at an airport, but you're not concerned about a cocaine <coughs> smuggler being on a freedom Bless you. on a, an if FOC I did boat. That, I would have blown my head off. I can't sneeze quite like Well, we, we're. Sorry, I missed that. The first, the, first, the first part of your question, mm. we're concerned about a person's criminal behaviour as that may provide avenues of behaviour which may lead them to be a threat to the transport system. Uh, in the second situation, other agencies such as Border Force or the uh, police agencies are concerned about criminality in relation to drugs and narcotics. Yeah. And if I might add... Well, wasn't there a North Korean boat that famously was sailing up and down the coast? looking for a place to dock and unload 100 kilos of heroin? Uh, I yes, there was. Yes. <laughs> and what did you think about that? Was that 
terrorism or was that just Again, it opportune was, drug smuggling? Trade. It, it was it was it was a criminal act <laughs> as opposed to terrorism. If I North might, Korea. If if I might add, um, Senator. Our regime, again, it applies um, regardless of what the um, criminality of someone might be or the security. If you are accessing a secure zone, you either need to have an, uh, an, uh, an M6 sorry, or you need to be continuously monitored by someone who has an M6 in a secure zone. So it's irrespective of who you are or, or what your intention is. I'll give up. OK, I just want to bring you back to the... To the uh my line of questioning, okay? So back to our inquiry, which is still going. So it's heard about the vulnerability of foreign seafarers sourced from developing countries replacing Australian workers, which is true, on our coastal trade to the degree, to the degree, I should say, that our entire domestic fuel and dangerous goods like ammonium nitrate are now only shipped by foreign flag ships. The vast majority of FSCs whose crews only require and MCV, which our advice or we advice takes 24 to 48 hours to get. Does the OTS consider the MSIC, which can take months to get, superior to the MCV in regards to its reliability and identification of its holder? Senator, they have two different purposes. One is an immigration check, um, and I'm, I can't talk to what it uh, includes. Uh, the MSIC, though, as we've spoken about it before, um, it is a, a relatively rigorous uh, regime and yep. we are trying to obviously strengthen it. Short yeah. answer to your question is yes, we do regard the MSIC as a higher level of protection for those wishing to interfere with maritime operations, um, recognising that those who are on MCVs uh, would not normally hold an MSIC and have to be escorted through any uh, sensitive area of a port. Yeah, I understand, Mr. Murdoch. You see, but back, I'll go back to the good old days, me and me best thongs and going out blue singlet. And I know exactly <coughs> about ammonium nitrate. And Miss Wilmar's talking about terrorism. And ammonium nitrate's not just something we can disregard. Because I know how heavily policed the ammonium nitrate distribution is in our st state by road. And the rigid laws around the truck, he can't leave the bucket of snot net in for a shower. He's got to stay there with it for all sorts of obvious reasons. So I wanted to hear that the MSIC is far more rigorous because it still brings me back that the MCV, you don't really know who all these people are, like you do, whereas if they're going for an MSIC, and you can't disregard that this could be a terrorism threat. But again, as- Foreign seafarers that again, aren't, as, you don't as, know who they are. As Ms Wimmer indicated, the MCV is a immigration uh, clearance process. But if they blow the bloody thing up, Mr Murdoch, it's got nothing to do with immigration. This comes back to you, Miss Wimmer, and your mob. This, but is, this, is, this could be a good talk for If someone has an MCV, they are still required to, to either be escorted in a secure I area. Know, I know, I know, but do not try and fob me off with foreign seafarers on MCVs, not M6, who are carting Australia's fuel supply around our, our nation and our dangerous goods, including ammonium nitrate. So you can't tell me this is rigid as it comes. You don't, you can't tell me that. Well, we're certainly not trying to fob you off, Senator. We wouldn't no. do that. No, some might, but I know you wouldn't, Mr Murdoch. Because you know how passionate I am about this. So can you tell me, Ms Winmar, how many MCV applications have been rejected over the past two years? No, sorry, I can't. That, that would be a question for immigration. For immigration, OK. Immigration. All right. Can you tell me how many MCV applications have been rejected over the same period? I don't think I can, but I can take it on notice. And why don't you think? Is it something... Sorry, I've got some statistics. I'm just not sure that I'd like are. to share it with you because I would like to know that if someone's been knocked back for an M6, it's not because they've got cross eyes um, or a bad tattoo. What was the period again <coughs> that you were interested in? Oh, the last two years. Because if you're going to get knocked back for an M6, it's going to be a very good reason. Yeah, but the findings are not eligible. So in the last um, in the last two years, so if I say the financial year 2015-16, yep. um, of those uh, MSIC applications that were completed, and we obviously do have withdrawals when perhaps extra information is sought and sure. someone doesn't come through. This was one of my first inquiries when I came in the Senate. I remember it vividly. Right. So. Um, 
Uh, 497 have not, been not found bad. ineligible, okay. that's right. Yep. And in the financial year 2016, 17, and obviously we haven't completed that financial year yet, 310 to date. Right, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I could actually give you the, if you're interested in the 2014 15 financial year. Yeah, yeah, throw that at me too, so please. That was 619. How many people applied? Uh, I can give you the numbers of MSIC applications completed, if that helps. For the 14-15 financial year, 56,786. So we're talking about 1%, are we? Uh, we are talking about, for the 2014-15 <coughs> financial <coughs> year, 1.09%. Okay, thank you. So I think, um, sadly, I think I know the answer, but I hope I'm wrong, Ms Winmar. So is OTS concerned that MSIC and MCV are regulated through different agencies? Uh, no, we're not, because they have different purposes. Not at all. I am. I am really. Do you believe this could impact on national security if there's if it's not the the one agency doing all the checks? Senator bear in mind, bear in mind, Miss Winmark, we had Captain Salas, the admitted gun runner, who mysteriously lost one person overboard, two killed, running in and out of Gladstone, and you mob, not you personally, none of you mob knew about it. It was Mr. Owen Jacques, the reporter from the Sunshine Coast, who knew. Senator um, Judy Zelke, Deputy Secretary. I wonder where you were. Oh, there you are. Hello. Good evening. How are you this evening? I can't stop laughing, Miss Selby. Um, I just thought it might be helpful to um, offer you a document that we provided um, to uh, the, uh, uh, the committee. Um, so if you recall, on the 4th of December 2015, we had a similar conversation in relation to the role many? of the different pieces of legislation, um, uh, whether it be an MSIC or a um, MCV or the role of um, uh, Border Force, for example, the role of immigration, etc., cetera, um, and the way in which each of them uh, play different roles in relation to the way in which people access our, our, uh, our shores. Um, we provided that um, back in January uh, last year. I actually find it a very helpful document to actually set out the different roles um, that, that we each of those pieces of legislation play. Um, uh, more than happy um, to uh, provide that to the Secretariat now, if you'd find that helpful to refer to. But you know, thank I, you. I listened very carefully to Senator Stills' line of questioning, and I understand you have different uh, legislation. But the simple person in the street will see a ship coming down the coast, and they'll see. <coughs> 56,000 Australians applying for a MISIC card, 1% failure, and then they'll see the majority of shipping crewed by people who get a migration card and no security check. How does that reassure well, me? So, but so also, importantly, I'm recognising different purposes of those two regulatory systems, but also recognising that those people with an MCV can have, cannot operate unescorted within a port environment they have to be escorted or under supervision at all times. Okay. And, and with respect, Secretary Murdoch, I've worked for 12 years in an airport. I've worked for a number of years in a lot of the ports around Australia. And I see ships crew coming and going, selling watches, selling tobacco freely in those places. And if you are relying on a security guard escorting a whole uh, line of crew, um, I think you might need to go down and have a look to what really happens. Well, I and, and my simple point remains, yeah. from a terrorist perspective, we are well guarded. 56,000 applicants, 1% who fail. The majority of ships are crewed by people who are not subject to the same level of scrutiny. Sure. And you can say that they're escorted in and out, but their intentions are not evaluated. Their criminal background, their history of employment is not evaluated. They're free to come and go to our coast. And the only constraint you say is I have to be escorted in and out of the port. So, Senator, oh, Senator, I was just going to say that in relation to this document, it also does refer to the checks that are done by our immigration department when an MCV is actually um, <coughs> actually applied for. I'll, I'll make sure that you have that information as well. I mean, my point would be, why don't they get a missing card? So, why it wasn't Australians doing it? But anyway, I look at now, that's one of the oh, okay, thanks, beauty. So what I want to do now is just want to bring you back to a YouTube video, 
uh, where the International Transport Workers Federation National Coordinator, oh, watch this, he's me mate, I actually watched it, showed me. He boarded a foreign flag ship alongside an inner city wharf in Glebe, in Sydney. Just walked up, came here. And it was taken just over a year ago and shown to the Senate inquiry in March. That's when we saw it. So I asked them, how can anyone access a foreign-owned, foreign-flagged, foreign cruise ship in a working Australian port without any checks at all? Senator, I think I know the video you're referring to, um, but I'd need to clarify. I think that the, chat, the, the issues there were that the... Uh, the port was not necessarily a regulated port and there was not necessarily a security uh, zone in operation at the time that that vessel... So Glebe? That's right. In Sydney, in, in Sydney is not a regulated port? I'd have to uh, go back and worse. check, but from recollection... No, I, let us take that on notice, Senator. I, I don't know... Let me... I have it. I'm not familiar with the YouTube video. I will go and review it <coughs> and come back to you with advice in relation to access to that vessel. Yep. And how anyone can just climb on a foreign flag. Did, did that person have an have an MSIC? He probably has got an MSIC, but it wasn't shown. So he's filmed all did, the way. He's did filmed he, in his car driving. Did he get up access there. to the vessel by virtue of his ITF role? I don't know. No, no, no there was no one around. When the video we saw, he showed the committee. High time. <laughs> Although he would, if, if it's the video I'm thinking about, he was actually uh, welcomed on board by the captain. Yeah, so. Who may have known him and known whether he had an MSIC or not. That's why I question whether he was there. <laughs> Go for it, please, and you can come back and tell we'll, us. We'll review it. And How come you try back. fishing on them? Have you try going down Freo with your hand line and a couple of muleys? Jesus, they pounce on you like that. Uh, you no idea. If the video highlights any deficiencies <coughs> in the regime, we'll address. We'll uh, take action on those matters. Oh, great. Okay. So, does anyone ever check those foreign crews during their nine-month contract, over which time they never leave the Australian case, or is it just all done over computer? Uh, uh, that's th not that 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 immigration. Yes, that's so immigration. That would be border force. Yep. Okay. Border force. Yep. Same thing. Okay. Can you tell me how many of our ports in Australia have no physical barriers or security checks to the ship's gangway? Uh, Senator, so um, I think we've had the conversation possibly before about secure zones can actually sure, be yeah. ephemeral, that they may apply when a ship's um, in uh, in the port, but then not apply. So they, they can be uh, on a... They basically aren't there permanently. So it's very hard to say where there is a secure zone and where there is not a secure zone that might be actually managing access to that vessel. So is it fair to say that there are some ports that don't that aren't regulated? So evil doers could just slip into that port. There are certainly ports that we don't regulate every port. That's right. Is there some ports we only regulate some berths? Um, I, I didn't know this. There, there are certainly, um, and Richard, help me out if I. Senator, it will depend on the operations of the port. Yeah. There will be some ports who will have permanent zones established for the ship to shore interface. There will be some ports where the zones will be turned on depending on the arrival and departure patterns of vessels. Uh, there, there are other ports, as Ms Wimmer has said, that are not security regulated ports. So it really depends on the operation of the port and the type and the frequency of traffic which is coming in and out of that port. So what about Glebe? Is that a regulated port? We'd have to take that one on notice and, and get back to you. Ooh, okie dokie. All right, so in relation to the government's response to the Rats Committee's interim report to FOCs, I'm now going to ask, have you read the government's response to the input at all or any parts of it of the flag of convenience shipping produced by this committee? I yes. know you have. You've read it all. Okay. So we endorse 10 recommendations for the government to consider in, in the report. The government in its response rejected six of the recommendations and just noted the remaining four. So the first recommendation um, that the Commonwealth undertakes a review of Australia's maritime sector is met with the following response from the government. Another view is unlikely to change the current decline of the Australian shipping industry. Do you agree with that statement? The Senator, that, that's outside of my mandate. They don't need help. Now, look, now this is serious stuff. This is really serious stuff. They don't need covering. They should be able to sit there. They should be able to sit there. This is Australian national security. You mob couldn't wait to go to every election screaming about foreigners coming down here, blowing us up or doing whatever. So I don't expect you to start protecting their backside. We've worked together too closely these years, and that's very poor judgment. At 9 o'clock at night, very poor judgment. 
And I don't so expect that from Mr. colleagues that I've worked closely with, no matter who's in government. government. I think that it, it's probably a question more appropriately directed to the government, to the minister. Mm -hmm. Okay, minister, do you agree with that? You couldn't wait to be part of a government that was threatening us about what the Muslims are going to do. Enough commentary. <laughs> no, I'm really going to hang on this because that was see, opinion, I'm... Senator Stell, and I'm very happy to take that on notice. Oh, through the yeah, all right. Look, I'll tell you Senator what, Stell, you know I'm not the I have been wound up Sarah, enough by I'm those very, clowns from Cassis. I'm so very, I'm very, very off there. happy to accommodate you, Senator Stell, and of course I will do that for you. I just don't need any more rubbing up after the insult from that mob from Cassa because they're, they're not Cassa. Yeah, it's it was. Who was it? Mate. Yeah, Cassa, that mob. Blame him. Pack of fools. Senator, Senator Stell. Anyway, do you agree with what I just said, with that response? Uh, look, that's a statement of the government's position. Uh, that's, that's not something that we as officials can comment on. So in their submission to the inquiry, Australian Border Force made this startling declaration. The department notes that while a significant proportion of legitimate sea trade is conducted by ships with FOC registration, <coughs> there is features of FOC registration regulation and practice of organised crime syndicates or terrorist groups may seek to exploit. And they go further to say these features are a lack of transparency of the identity of ship owners, no argument from me, um, and, con and consequent impediment to holding the owner to account for the ship's actions, and insufficient flag state regulator enforcement and adherence to standards. Given the severity of Australian Border Force's concerns, would you agree with that we need to continue looking at this issue until those concerns are negated? Um, it's not a matter of opinion. Given the strength of what you've outlined, uh, Australian Border Force views, I'm sure they will continue to look at those issues. Thank you. I'll go to Recommendation 5. Have you got it in front of you? Say, we read it all. Uh, yes, I've got well, it. Let's go to Recommendation 5, OK? That's, that's easier. So would it be fair to say that foreign seafarers on FOC vessels are in a position to complain about their paying conditions while in Australian waters? I was being preached to audio, or earlier about the ILO conventions and all that sort of stuff. I'm sorry, I just thought you got recommendation five in front of me. I've got it in front of me, Senator. Um, sorry, oh, it's question. not fair. I didn't give you the opportunity to read it. I, I've read it. Oh, OK. What do you reckon then? Uh, well, there are provisions there and uh, we know there are situations either through port state control inspections or through uh, you know issues that are brought to the attention of fair work where uh, crew crew remuneration has been highlighted and brought to attention so foreign seafarers foreign seafarers so does the government have the capacity to ensure the welfare of seafarers once they leave our shores uh, well clearly Australia's capacity is is in relation to our port state control and the application of Australian laws yeah, it's, it's a loaded question because I know the answer, Mr. Verdex. I'm saying we don't. Right, that's right. Yeah. Indicated in my very hmm. public servant way. Well, now you've all <laughs> now you've all upset me. I don't want to ask any more questions. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank the Lord, Senator. Senator, it's a long time. Yeah, Chair, now, um, Ms. Winner, I just wonder. Do you have an MSIC or have you ever applied for one? No, I don't have an MSIC, but I have an ASIC. Mr. Farmer, Senator, I have an ASIC. MSIC? No, Senator. That's just what people are building caveats either. Ms. Zelke, have you ever applied for an MSIC? No, Senator. I've been escorted each time I've been in a port Secretary? with a secure area. No, I similarly have had an ASIC, but not an MSIC. Yes. So, can I ask the three of you, have you ever been onto a port? That's where my best Yes, yes Senator. Senator. And uh, were you quizzed, or was the person who held the MSIC uh, quizzed at the point of entry as to who you were? Senator, in my situation, I actually had to fill out paperwork before, uh, in the days before attending the port so that it could actually be cleared by the port um, security before I arrived and then um, I was signed on to be able to access the port. Um, that's three different ports that I've had that situation. Senator, my experience has been that I've normally been with a port operator who is expecting me. So I've, I've not had any of that issue. Same. Pre managed. Same, Senator, but on entering the zone, I was, um, or the person escorting me was questioned by the security guard as to why I was coming into the zone. So I had an MSIC for 18 months. I can't think how much it cost me, $380 on it, for the port of Fremantle. <coughs> I wasn't eligible uh, to go to any other port. Uh, and uh, never once was anyone ever at a gate to quiz me. Uh, as it happened, I never took anybody else 
into the Port of Fremantle with me, but I certainly went in on many occasions before I paid my 300 and whatever dollars, and at no time have I ever been quizzed by anybody, a security guard or anybody else, either before I held an MSIC in the company of someone who did, or when I had a person or people with me who were there as my guests. I've never ever in the Port of Fremantle been quizzed, which causes me to ask the question, it's so wide open, isn't it, that it, it defies any value in terms of security <clears throat> because nobody, in my case, either as a guest of an MSIC holder or as an MSIC holder with guests, ever challenged me. Uh, Senator, if, I'm, if I might refer back to the conversation we had about uh, maritime security zones. M MSICs only relate to maritime security zones. Correct. And maritime <coughs> security zones don't necessarily cover the entire port. Well, they, um, they, I can assure you when there's a livestock carrier in and there are the all sorts of... The <coughs> Sorry? That's the stop set of the rice attacking you. Well, when there's all sorts of people in and around or wanting to get around the port, uh, I can assure you that certainly is an uh, area of, let's call it a protective zone. And <coughs> so the way our legislation works, which um, is, uh, it does establish maritime security zones. They are requested by the industry participant that we regulate. Um, as to where they will be established and when they will be established. And if they've made a judgment that at particular times they don't need one, there won't be any MC controls around access to any areas at the port. So is it always the case that the application process and the scrutiny process is outsourced from your department? Um, sorry, I'm not quite sure I understand. Well, I had to apply to the Fremantle Port Authority. Yes, that's right. So the issuing bodies for MSIC cards are, um, are commercial in, uh, bodies or they are, say, a port or an airport. Um, the actual background checking process, though, is undertaken within government and all of those uh, issuing bodies, which is how we term them, they actually work <coughs> with uh, Auscheck in the Attorney General's Department and they um, basically, as soon as the background check is, um, is cleared, good to go, they issue the card on that basis. And we manage compliance by those issuing bodies with regulations to make sure that they're um, protecting cards, issuing cards in the right mm -hmm. way and keeping records. Now, are there instances in which uh, the, the department, through the issuing body, <coughs> have refused cards, but that has been overruled? And if so, by what process can that be overruled? Uh, so, um, the, uh, if the check, uh, if the background check comes back and the card is not, uh, the person is not eligible to hold a card, right. they can uh, apply to the department for a card in a discretionary review. Yes. Um, and the department um, has the, uh, basically does a review of their situation and um, then we make a decision about whether they should receive a card on that basis. Um, there is an appeals process. They can go to the, uh, to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and in cases, um, yes, we have been overturned by the AAT on our decisions not to issue a card. And can you give us any explanations as to why the Administrative Appeals Tribunal would <coughs> overrule what is obviously a very comprehensive process? Uh, Senator, as we, were, um, we discussed earlier, um, the AAT um, looks very narrowly at the purpose in the maritime um, and uh, maritime security. Sorry, now I'm getting my act um, acronym wrong. Sorry, uh, Maritime Transport um, Security and Offshore Facilities Act um, purpose, and they specifically noted have specifically noted in cases that discretion must be exercised in accordance with the language by which it is conferred and to achieve the purposes for which the power has been granted, and they have taken a very narrow interpretation and of the And if they have taken a narrow interpretation, have you as the department recommended to government that there should be a tightening of that legislation to close that loophole? Senator, yes we have, and there is a piece of legislation that should be uh, introduced in, or, uh, in the Senate in the June sittings to deal with that. Excellent. We'll watch that with interest. I've got to say to you, Minister, it took me some time before my application was approved, which I can't possibly believe there would have been any hold-up, but there may well have been. 
What did impress me was on the anniversary of the date in which it expired, since I wasn't willing to pay another $375, I was obliged on that day to actually yield up the, uh, the card. I also have asked questions before in this place about why it's not possible for people like ourselves who might want to visit a number of ports, as I might want to do in the con connection, for example, with live export trade, as to why I couldn't be given a multiple port entry. So, Secretary, that's something you might take up. Totally unrelated, <clears throat> we know that the US and the UK are looking at or have indeed banned the carriage of electronic devices from carry-on baggage on flights into Australia. What action is the Department taking in this space? What advice to government is the Department giving in this space? Senator, um, from the 6th of April, the government applied additional security measures for some Australian inbound flights. So passengers travelling on direct flights to Australia from the Middle East now may randomly uh, be selected to undergo an explosive trace detection test prior to boarding the aircraft. Um, those additional measures are applying to um, inbound flights to Australia from the Middle East from uh, Doha in Qatar, Abu Dhabi in the UAE and also Dubai in the UAE. Can you tell me what the difference to the risk of passengers and the ultimate aircraft is? Whether someone has got a laptop computer in the cabin with equipment on board capable of blowing the plane up or whether the laptop computer is in their suitcase in the hold? Uh, so, Senator, we have uh, worked with the AFP in their forensics facility where they have explosive um, uh, technicians and their advice to us is that in the hold of an aircraft there are great, a few, fewer vulnerabilities in terms of um, an explosive being able to penetra penetrate the, um, the, the hull of the aircraft, basically, um, uh, compared to the um, passenger um, cabin. And so it is, there's a greater probability that an explosive won't actually have a significant damaging effect in the hold compared to in the cabin. In the hold. Thank you for that. That seems to be... So at the moment it's Doha, it's, it's Abu Dhabi, it's Dubai? That's right. <coughs> Bahrain doesn't get a Guernsey? We don't have any direct flights from Bahrain. Bahrain. Correct. And uh, no, other, no other port. So what if... What if somebody leaves uh, Madrid and flies to Abu Dhabi and on flies to Australia with, uh, uh, with, with that airline? What, if any, controls does Australia exercise in that, in that situation? So because they're transiting a port in, um, say, Dubai, they will be screened in Dubai with these additional security measures. By Australia has, uh, by the airline um, or the airport authority, depending on uh, what's happening in that particular state. But they will. We have uh, basically um, asked them voluntarily, and they have all agreed to apply these additional security measures for us. So it's a random exercise, is it? It is a random exercise for passengers travelling to Australia. Yes, uh, it has to be on every flight. Sorry, let me clarify what random is. It must be for every flight, but the uh, selection of passengers is random on that flight. It, it's similar to your experience of explosive trace detection mm. in the Australian domestic airport situation. Uh, what, we, what we are able to do effectively as the risk profile changes is increase the level of uh, selection of passengers to be ETD screened. But as we all know, Mr Murdoch, I'll finish here. It, I mean, I've done this for two and a half years now just as an exercise. Uh, I have been able to avoid being a person called out for detection for two and a half years. How? Because obviously when my bags are coming through, if I don't want to be the subject of detection and I'm just because I sit in the Senate, uh, I make sure that I mess around, you know, putting stuff back in my briefcase or getting my while taking, but if I have to take my shoes off and I just ensure that by the time I'm ready to leave, the person undertaking the uh, explosive testing is already testing someone else. Okay. So if an idiot like me is able to achieve that in a two and a half year period, someone bent on ill intent 
can certainly... It's, uh, you don't have to laugh at this, Minister. Um, I mean, you don't have to I'm agree. I'm not laughing. I'm, I'm just trying I, to entertain whether that might just, just be very lucky. Like you said when you said something. Thank you very much. Senator, um, uh, I'll ask Ms Wimmer to explain <laughs> why, but I think your days are numbered yeah. in, terms of, in terms of your ability to do this. Well, two and a half years isn't a bad run, I reckon. It's <laughs> probably been a good run, but I think it's over. Um, so, Senator, we, we became... I've been tagged. <laughs> no, we've actually... We've, we, we're aware that people are gaming the system in the way that you describe. Um, and we have... Uh, I can't remember exactly when it was, but we have actually changed the system. We've required airports now to use randomisers. Uh, most of them are using the walk-through metal detectors to actually select um, the... Um, person to be screened uh, using the explosive trace detection equipment, uh, whereas previously it was the screeners that were selecting those people, which meant you could game the system. Now it actually, they, you generally get selected as you walk through the, uh, the metal uh, and detector walkway. And it the will screeners actually will identify you to the ETD. That's right. So they will actually, even if you are um, faffing around, um, they will actually wait for you to stop and then they will screen They're you. They're going to wait for you to put your shoes back on this the day. It's happened to me, Senator <laughs> well, I, I must be a dangerous entrant minister because travelling through Houston from Panama the other day with my diplomatic passport, I was thrown into the sin bin. I've protested this to the foreign minister and to the acting US ambassador. And since Senator John McCain was due to come here, I suggested that Senator McCain might also be subjected to the same scrutiny that I was in the sin bin. I Thank can, you. I can help, Chair, through you, I can help. We must learn to take your veterinary gloves off when you're travelling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. It's a leather apron the gloves will give you away. We've created a whole new world, haven't we, Senators? So, so I've been through, uh, what do you call it? I've been through Doha three times this year, and Dubai and Abu Dhabi. It's in Mosul law. But but basically, I've been in transit. So, what are you checking for for transit passengers who basically don't get any security check? So, Senator, I've still got an iPad. I can still have a. The the iPad. only flights we're concerned about are those direct flights to Australia, and so that's where we have placed the additional security measures. So, unless you were actually mo uh, flying on to Australia, yeah. and it was after the sixth of April, you wouldn't have seen any additional security. Well, it was measures. after the sixth of April, and I just walked out of the first class lounge down a private staircase and onto the plane. You, well, there, you, you wouldn't have been then selected for the random ETD. <laughs> I definitely wasn't. I didn't see any security. Again, a bit like Senator Back, your, num your number's up. We'll, we'll, we'll seek you out next time. If he just, yeah. just comes out of the first class lounge, you wouldn't want to be with him anyway. <laughs> now, has anyone got any serious questions at this yeah. time? No, they were serious. No, no. We're okay. get on right, the so now no, we've no. gone through the... Um, Does that nothing, Senator Rice? No. Uh, that completes Office of Transport <laughs> Security. I think so. Thank you. We all agreed on that. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ms. Swimmer. Uh, and uh, <coughs> safe travel to you all. Until well, you get to security. This won't take long. This is a very, very well managed portfolio. Which one's this one? Local Government and Territories Division. Oh, no, hang on. Surface transport. I've been waiting all day for this. Surface transport. I thought we'd agreed to skip that. No, no, I've got some no. okay. very quick. <laughs> if I don't have questions, questions here, Miss Selke won't sleep tonight. Surface transport? Can I go? Surface no. transport? No. Oh, haven't we done no, Which one of you has got the Dorothy Dixes? No, I've got my own here. These are my own. Right These are my own. <laughs> I'm telling you. Chair, if, while we're getting set up, can I just check the committee still wants to continue with the agenda as is? So surface <laughs> transport, <laughs> local government and territories I won't take uh, and Western Sydney unit. Yep. That's uh, it. It's 20 past nine. Um, where are we at? Service transport. Service transport. <laughs> no, that's fine. We'll, we'll have the officers here for all three. Look, I'm given to understand, uh, and uh, we've no way of controlling this, but we should get through the... We, we anticipate getting through all you the are, there's probably There's probably a good hour. Is that about right? Not sure, yeah. Oh, I'm... Depends on the answers. No, I've got 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. You can now at uh, we might 10 have. past 9, 20 past 10. Yeah, we've met Mel and Deary's about an hour or all up. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you might want to stop for a smoke, eh? Quick one, mate. No, no, I'm just trying to think. It, oh, OK. It's what about hard. local government? You got much? Yeah, Mel and Deary's got a few things for local government. I've got a bit on local, a bit on local government. So are we going to get to Western Sydney yard or can we let them yeah, go? Yeah, well, I suppose so. Hey? Depends on the answers. Yeah, I understand that, but I mean, we're... Do you want to hold? Yeah. Yeah. Righto. Sorry. Let's proceed, Will. Yes.
Thank you, Chair. No discharges today. Okay, I just want to quickly do some shipping stuff. Surprise, surprise. Service transport? Yeah, on the coastal Service. shipping reform. Ms Selkin? So, I'll just get straight to the point. It's a lot easier. You know all the uh, shortcuts and the cover-ups and the managed uh, answers, so I'll go straight to you. So, uh, bad feedback that the government's received from stakeholders in terms of the coastal shipping reforms uh, the, uh, has told the Minister, right, feedback has told the Minister that the current regulation of coastal shipping creates a range of administrative issues Chairman for shipping Minister companies and Australian Minister. businesses. So can you tell us who, was, who were the stakeholders and what were the administrative issues encountered? Um, so, Senator, the um, administrative issues have uh, been the topic of conversation uh, since uh, uh, towards the end of 2012. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, we've had a number of occasions to consult with stakeholders oh, over, that, over that time. Um, yeah. And most recently, of course, we have the latest discussion paper um, that was uh, put out recently in relation to the coastal shipping reforms, um, seeking uh, feedback again. Um, that uh, most recent discussion paper actually goes through uh, a number of those um, issues that uh, companies have been raising with administrative burden um, in relation to, to this, the legislation. So, uh, for example, um, one of the key ones that is raised is the fact that we, under the legislation, require a minimum of five voyages to be applied for. Yep. Uh, we do have a, a range of stakeholders at companies who would like to move goods um, for which their um, their needs are infrequent and therefore um, uh, ships can't actually uh, allocate what those five voyages will be for um, and therefore are unable to apply for a licence. Uh, we've had situations um, in that particular circumstance where that's led to companies having to move goods by um, truck, for example, um, because they're not able to actually move them on a ship, therefore. Um, we have other examples in relation to some of the reporting requirements. Uh, for example, um, if a, a ship is going to be late um, in docking or actually loading, um, there are certain um, allowances provided in relation to it. We found that uh, they're not meeting the needs of most companies. So, for example, if another ship is held up in front of a ship, it can't move into a berth. Um, it will actually be in breach of the legislation uh, uh, in certain circumstances. How often will that happen? Uh, it happens uh, fairly regularly in relation to it. Um, we have a, a situation, of course, where companies will report to us then that they have that this has actually occurred. Um, but of course, if we have an allowance that was, an, um, for example, an extra day for them to do that, uh, they wouldn't be in breach. So we've got enough information on how the legislation works now to be able to better ascertain <coughs> those limits that we should put in place. Thank you. So who are the stakeholders? <coughs> the, um, uh, uh, I'll ask Ms Werner if she has a list in front of her, but otherwise they're all on, available on our website with the various submissions that have actually been provided. Okay. S Senator Stoll, Stephanie Werner, General Manager, Maritime and Shipping. Uh, so we provided a previous question on notice um, listing the stakeholders who had been consulted on coastal shipping. There were 194 of them. I can read them out if you No, like. look, I'll tell you what, I'll get to the point because I was reading the submission from North Star Cruises. Were they consulted? Uh, yeah. Yes, Senator. Was the whole entire cruise industry consulted? They were provided with the opportunity, um, Senator. Uh, we'd have to uh, double check exactly uh, who was in the industry as opposed to those that made submissions. Yeah. But we went to the industry associations um, and invited submissions through them as well where they passed on that information. Sure. But I'm not sure if every single one attended a consultation. Yeah, I'd be very interested to know because they're on, you know, they're fired up as you know. That they are really unhappy people. But anyway, um, I'm sure they'll have reason to be unhappy the way that things might be going. Let's hope I'm wrong. So can I take you to the coastal shipping reforms document? And I want to go to the amendments. And I thought I had it all worked out. What did I do with them? Just bear with me. Where are they? Have you took my reforms? 
Amendment. Is it page five, Senator? Well, certainly, of course it is. Thanks, Ms. Selke. There it is. Okay, so I want to go to these. So instead of all the preamble, let's just go straight to to these. So I want to talk about um, remove the five voyage minimum requirement. That's number one, right? Mm -hmm. Recommendation number one. So what does this mean for maritime security? Uh, Senator, it wouldn't actually change any of the other arrangements. Is that, uh, sorry, is that the intent of your question? Or? Yeah, because I, I want to know what do you have to do to obtain first a temporary licence? So the temporary licence um, relates to um, seeking approval for the voyages that a ship will undertake. It, um, it doesn't actually directly relate to, for example, MSIC holders or MCVs at all. It's about whether the, the um, ship is eligible um, or the ship operator is eligible um, to apply for the voyage and the goods, etc., that are being carried right, at that sorry, time. Sorry, because no. this was a, uh, uh, it was a five voyage minimum, wasn't it? It was, and sorry well, if I didn't is. say that earlier. So, yeah, still, that's where I just confused myself, that's all right, because but the, the recommendation is just to be single voyages. Yeah, so, yep. so to provide that flexibility for um, people who, who don't have certainty of voyages. So what will happen to the temporary licence after the sing, singular voyage? Um, so generally the um, companies apply for a licence and then they apply to get approval for the voyages that they're undertaking. So the licences are approved for a 12 month period mm -hmm. um, and then they apply for the voyages that they will undertake under that licence. So if they undertake so one... So they'll still have it? They'll still have it for the 12 month okay. period. <laughs> okay, so, so how soon after the temporary licence expiring can someone apply for another one? I think they can actually apply for it before um, it's expired. Oh, okay. Ms. Burnham? Yes, that's yes, correct. Yes, that's correct. Oh, so we could get to the stage where someone just continually rolls on applying for temporary licences, get that temporary licence, might only do one year but has got it in the cupboard. So that they, they're always, and a good example of that, Senator, is actually ship, um, sorry, cruise ships. Um, so for example, uh, they actually, um, have a requirement to be able to plan into the future by several years. So they will often need to be a couple of years up in relation to their approvals so that they can actually go out and advertise for the crews that they need. And I understand that. Look, and I won't transgress too much, but I understand the big lines and what they want to do and all that. But you see, this is the grief. And that's the coming. little, oh, sorry. Well, this is the grief that's coming into the little ones, particularly North Star Cruises and the mob around Broome and that, because you see what we've been, or what I've been told is that foreign vessels with foreign crews on far less uh, wages, far less conditions can actually load up in Darwin, shoot up to Indonesia, get the passport stamped and then cruise the West Coast. So, um, Senator, at the moment, under the mm. current legislation, um, they uh, are only um, required to seek um, approval for voyages where they're actually um, coming on, on coast and actually um, dropping off and picking back up again on coast. So, yes, they can actually come into port, mm -hmm. um, allow their passengers to visit, um, you know, noting they'll have passports and those sorts of things mm -hmm. to come on shore, and then they can depart Australia again and continue on. So our permits and licensing system is in relation to coastal shipping. Yes. So where they're continuing around. So the if this line. changes, they're gonna, this is going. And you know, you've heard all the arguments from Mr. Milby and, and Co. The old mob up in Broome, and I'm sure you've heard it on the east coast because we heard it in the inquiry. That uh, this is the fear that they have. Uh, I understand that that's their concern, Senator. Sorry, I, I was. Yeah. I, I thought what you meant was that that would change that for them. That particular element won't change no. um, that. Okay, so let's go to number two: the streamlining the licensing process where no GL vessels are available. And could this mean that foreign flagged vessels would be allowed to carry petroleum products, as there are no Australian flagged vessels capable of doing so? Uh, and, and currently do in circumstances, Senator, yes. That being said, each time a ship currently wants to carry goods, that voyage, no matter what the circumstance, is advertised to all general licence holders, even when we are aware that they don't actually have any ships that could carry those goods. So in effect, we're undertaking a step in the process where we know that there's no Australian ship to carry those goods. 
This would only in the circumstances where we know that there are no Australian ships to carry those goods would remove the need for us to go out and advertise it to all of the general licence holders. Well, well we know, Ms Selke, there, there are no Australian ships anymore. Yes. So it, so it, it would have that. to be confirmed that there were no Australian ships available in the first instance. So has the department identified any dangers with that system? Possible dangers? Um, nothing, um, nothing additional, um, Senator, in that regard. So there are obvious risks in all systems, but no, not, not under the, this arrangement. I think you and I could go on all night and just, you know, and have this conversation. So and for the purposes of the timing, I'm going to pass on to my colleague, Senator Gallagher.